Mario Molina wrote in 1995 that the ozone layer acts as an atmospheric shield which protects life on Earth against harmful ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun. We're talking about ultraviolet B radiation primarily that causes sunburn and skin cancer. The purpose of my talk today is to talk about the heat, the energy relationships of the ozone depletion. And let me change the statement a little bit by saying the ozone layer acts as an atmospheric blanket heated by absorbing the most energetic solar ultraviolet radiation reaching the lower stratosphere. Now the red line in this diagram shows the amplitude or brightness of solar radiation reaching the top of the atmosphere. And the green line shows the amplitude or brightness of solar radiation reaching Earth. It's rather clear from this diagram that all of the frequencies above about 1040 terahertz, shaded red here, are absorbed in the upper atmosphere in order to create the thermosphere, the ionosphere, and the stratosphere. Now, atmospheric chemists tell us that energy in the atmosphere is equal to H nu, Planck's constant times the frequency, shown here by the black dashed line. What this says is, as increasing frequency to the right, we have more energy. The higher the energy, the higher the temperature to which the absorbing body will be raised. It's a very important statement. The ozone layer is the place where the highest energy reaching close to Earth is finally absorbed, and then we get very little ultraviolet B normally reaching Earth. Now the green lines here, or green bars, show the percent increase in ultraviolet radiation reaching Earth when there's 1% depletion of the ozone layer based on calculations by Sasha Madronich. And what we notice is that 1% less ozone to absorb the ultraviolet B in the ozone layer can lead to as much as 2% increase in the ultraviolet B reaching Earth. And since 1970, ozone has been depleted up to about 15% in the mid-latitudes during certain times of the year, and up to 60% in polar regions. So the effect can be fairly large. Now the major warming in the atmospheric Earth system occurs in the stratosphere. And the temperature at the top of the stratosphere is kept about 70 degrees centigrade warmer than the temperature at the tropopause at the base of the stratosphere. And Basically, the stratosphere is warmed by dissociation of oxygen, ozone, and other molecules. When you dissociate a molecule, pieces fly apart at very high velocity. The temperature of a gas is equal or proportional to the kinetic energy of the gas, which is proportional to the velocity squared. So when we dissociate a molecule, we take the energy that holds the molecule together and convert it very efficiently to thermal energy. So ultraviolet C is depleting, uh, is dissociating oxygen. Ultraviolet B is dissociating uh, ozone. And we go back and forth on this all day long uh, dissociating uh, on the sunlit side of the Earth. And that this leads to uh, substantial warming in the stratosphere. Now we could talk about the stratosphere and the ozone layer as forming an electric blanket around Earth. And by electric, I mean that the energy to heat this blanket is coming from the distant sun, not from the body that's under the earth, under the, under the blanket, or the earth. Now, starting in the 1960s, chlorofluorocarbons became very popular because they were inert and much safer to use than some of the other things used for refrigerants, uh, for spray can propellants, uh, for solvents, and many other purposes. And what Molina and Rowland showed in 1974 is that when CFCs get high up into the stratosphere, they could be broken down by ultraviolet radiation. A series of chemical processes go forward that are enhanced in the vicinity of polar stratospheric clouds, and ultimately chlorine is released. One atom of chlorine can destroy 100,000 molecules of ozone. Now in the 1960s, we began to increase the number of chlorofluorocarbons emitted into the atmosphere, shown by the green line. It takes about five years for CFCs to get high enough in the stratosphere to be broken down. And sure enough, we noticed that the ozone depletion started increasing, the black line. And then temperatures started increasing, the red bars. 
Molina and Rowland, as I said earlier, pointed out this relationship between CFCs and ozone depletion. So that when we discovered the Antarctic ozone hole in 1985, we suddenly realized there was a serious problem here. And the Montreal Protocol was negotiated in record time, took effect January 1st, 1989. And that mandated the decrease in manufacturing of CFCs. Well, sure enough, by 1993, the increase of CFCs in the atmosphere stopped. By 1995, the ozone depletion in the atmosphere stopped. By 1998, the increase in temperature stopped, leaving the global warming hiatus where temperatures didn't change much between 1998 and 2013. Turns out volcanoes can also deplete ozone. The, green, the black line in this diagram shows the ozone measured at Arosa, Switzerland since 1927. And I've plotted it so it's the ozone depletion going up. And what stands out immediately on this graph is that the greatest depletion ever observed at Arosa, which is the longest measurements the, on Earth, uh, was following Pinatubo eruption. The ozone depletion following the eruption appears to come back to normal in less than 10 years. But notice the volcano Eyjafjallajökull in Iceland in 2010, which was a much smaller eruption, also caused major depletion. And in fact, the peaks and troughs of a lot of this line sh uh, shown on the graph do correlate with smaller volcanic eruptions. Now, when Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991, it led to regional warming of about 4 degrees centigrade in northern Siberia and northern North America for December, February, following the June eruption of, of Pinatubo. But globally, it led to a half a degree cooling for the next three years. What's going on here? Basically, chlorine and bromine emitted from the volcano uh, appears to have depleted the ozone layer, allowing more ultraviolet B through the ozone layer, arriving at Earth, causing global warming. But in addition, megatons of sulfur dioxide and water vapor were erupted up into the lower stratosphere, forming a sulfuric acid aerosol. And the molecules of this aerosol grew over many, many months until they were large enough to reflect and scatter sunlight mainly ultraviolet light, given the size of the molecules involved. And so this led to global cooling. This kind of global cooling following explosive eruptions was well observed after Pinatubo, El Chichon, Agung, and in fact, all of the major explosive eruptions throughout human history that have been documented. Now I'd like to talk about a totally different kind of volcanism, more like the volcanism we see in Iceland and Hawaii. This is effusive volcanism, not explosive, effusive. This is a picture of Bargabunga in August of 2014. It started to erupt, and in six months, it put out enough lava to cover an area of 85 square kilometers. That's the size of the island of Manhattan. This was the highest rate of basaltic lava production since 1783, a truly exceptional event. In this case, the chlorine and bromine coming up from the basaltic lavas, which we know contain high, high concentrations of, of all the halogens, uh, can lead to depletion of the ozone layer, causing global warming, but no aerosols of any significance were formed, so we didn't get the cooling. So effusive volcanoes warm, explosive volcanoes cool. And this is probably the reason, the Bunga is probably the reason why 2015, it looks like it's going to be the hottest year on record, or almost nearly the hottest year on record. Now, what's interesting when we look at temperature trends is that there are inflection points where there's sudden change in the temperature trends. For example, from 1945 to 1970, there was very little in change in temperature. From 1970 to 1998, there was a significant warming. From 1998 to 2013, there was very little change in temperature. And from 2014 to 2015, there was significant warming. Each of these inflection points can be explained very clearly by ozone depletion theory, as I've explained earlier in this talk. It's very difficult to explain these kind of inflection points by a slow increase in greenhouse gases. The greatest ozone depletion is also associated with the greatest regional warming. The ozone hole shown here for 2006 
the Antarctic Peninsula had the minimum monthly temperatures rose as much as 6.7 degrees centigrade from 1976 to 2000. This was the greatest warming observed on the peninsula in 1800 years, and it is worldwide the greatest warming observed in 1800 years. Winter sea ice decreased about 10% per decade. Southern oceans warmed at twice the global rate. The Bellinghausen Sea warmed at about one degree centigrade and the formation of cold Antarctic bottom water decreased. In the 1920s, Gordon Dobson noted a close relationship between ozone concentrations and weather. This animation shown on the, on the right is the daily total ozone deviations in the northern hemisphere. And what you can notice right away is there are big changes and they're going on all the time. The higher the concentration of ozone in the ozone layer, the more heat is generated in the ozone layer and the less heat reaches Earth. This has an effect on pressure highs and lows that we measure down on, on near the surface. More ozone in the ozone layer is associated with surface low pressure areas. Less ozone in the ozone layer is associated with surface high pressure areas. Ozone also affects the tropopause height, the boundary between cooling from below and heating from above. In this particular case above Montreal, Canada, the tropopause suddenly dropped six kilometers in 12 hours, while ozone suddenly increased 37%. Depletion of the ozone strengthens the polar vortex, and it has a big effect on the jet stream, often moving it south, causing it to meander more, causing storms to move more slowly, and leading, ushering pockets of cold air down into mid-latitudes. Now, what if there had been no Montreal Protocol? I'm suggesting the data show that the decrease in chlorine um, by 1993 led to the decrease in temperature. If that chlorine had continued to go up with no Montreal Protocol, I would argue that temperatures today would be about 1.3 degrees centigrade in the Northern Hemisphere, whereas the observed increase was 0.8. And this says that the Montreal Protocol appears to have prevented about a half a degree centigrade warming in addition to the 0.8 degrees centigrade that appeared. Mario, thank you very, very much. How sure are we about greenhouse gases? If energy is equal to H nu, then ultraviolet B is 48 times more energetic than infrared absorbed by greenhouse gases. More energetic means when it's absorbed, it heats the body much higher temperature. Radiation from a body of matter cannot heat that same body of matter. This is basic thermodynamics. There are many inflection points that I showed you in the temperature trends. These are very hard to explain in terms of greenhouse gases. There are widespread observations throughout the geologic record of sudden warming over the period of days, weeks, months, and a few years. We came out of the ice age 25 times in the last 100,000 years within less than a decade. These kinds of sudden warming are very difficult to explain by greenhouse gas changes. What's most surprising is that increases in greenhouse gases have never actually been shown experimentally to warm the atmosphere enough to cause global warming. This is why last November I issued the climate change challenge. It's very important we compare greenhouse warming theory with actual observations in the atmosphere. And I agree to pay $10,000 of my personal money to the first scientist that can show in the last 25 years that the warming was caused more by greenhouse gases than by ozone depletion. In conclusion, aerosols formed by explosive volcanism provide a clear, direct, and sufficient explanation for global cooling over the past 100 years and throughout the history of the planet, Earth. Ozone depletion caused by effusive volcanism, or CFCs, provides a clear, direct, and sufficient explanation for each of the major changes in global warming over the past hundred years and throughout Earth history. It's not clear here what the role of greenhouse gases really is. It's something we need to work out. It's very, very important for all life on Earth that we get this right. Thank you. <laughs>